television highlights of the news of yesteryear. back into yesterday at aviation's leading lady, Miss Amelia Earhart. It's 1928, and Miss Earhart's aircraft, Friendship, taxis toward English shore at Southampton after first landing in Wales. There's Miss Earhart in flying togs. No solo venture, this. Miss Amelia shares welcome from Southampton's woman mayor, Mrs. Welch, with Stoltz, her pilot, and Gordon, her plane's mechanic. On 6th of July, 1928, Amelia, again with Stoltz and Gordon, is given a big city welcome. This time it's New York who lauds Amelia as first woman to fly across Atlantic. Grover Whalen, Big Berg's official greeter, heads committee that makes Lady Lindy glad to be home again. Just year before, Lindy himself motored up this crowd line Manhattan Avenue as first man to leap the Atlantic alone. thousands cheer First Lady to accomplish flight. On steps of City Hall, Miss Earhart and crew are greeted by acting Mayor Joseph McKee, with Mayor being decorated too. A city pays homage to aviation's best girl. At Hatboro, Pennsylvania in 1930, Amelia becomes first woman to fly an auto gyro. Married to famed publisher, here helping her into strange craft, Amelia is Mrs. George Putnam now. But as far as planes are concerned, she's still Amelia Earhart of the airlanes, who will give flight to anything with wings. This is sort of ship Lady Lindy has never flown before, but she'll fly it just the same. It's historic moment in aviation as Amelia Earhart Putnam adds another first to her long list of achievements as a pretty pioneer of the air. The flight is over, but the brilliant career of Miss Earhart has some years to go. The mystery and tragedy of Amelia Earhart still lie in the far and unforeseeable future. It's now 1932. Back from solo venture from Newfoundland to Iceland, a 2,000 mile ocean hop, she's welcomed home by New York's Jimmy Walker. One of her most famous long water leaps is from Weaver Field, Hawaii, to Oakland, California. Here's finish of brilliant 2,400 mile journey, 18 and one quarter hours after takeoff. Two years after this thrilling flight, the story of a brave woman of the air enters a shroud of mystery. On round the world trip in 1937, she disappears over waters of Pacific, but world will never forget Amelia Earhart. Hans Svoboda of Germany and Match Cathedral. It's 26th of February, 1930, and in New York, Svoboda displays his replica of famed Cologne Cathedral. It took patient German three years to build this scale model of well-known edifice, for his building material consisted of glue and 3,500,000 matches. Svoboda had fun and made a church. Match manufacturers made a profit. two wars, practice for battle. It's 8th of October, 1926, and though military experts don't want or expect another war, newly developed weapons of war are tried and tested to be ready if war comes. World War II will be mechanized, they say, and they obviously knew what they were talking about. In San Diego, California, January 1927, this biplane is equipped with new type gun in anticipation of sky battles of any future war. 
Looking back from years beyond World War II, it's amazing what vision of the future was commanded by our military leaders in 1927. This is rehearsal for war that was not expected, not wanted. Yet when it came in 1941, plans of the 1920s readied us. Here's the great band leader and march maker, John Philip Sousa. It's 13th of April, 1927, and Sousa leads High School of Commerce Band in Boston. Later, he conducts band from Latin school. These pupils are getting pointers and perfection. Boys and girls of the Martin School Band can also tell their grandchildren they played under John Philip Sousa, composer of Fane March, Stars and Stripes Forever. Here, coming home on the liner Leviathan, is Miss Nita Naldi, as she looked in 1924. Famed siren and seductress of the silent screen, Miss Naldi scaled the Hollywood Heights in the heyday of Rudolph Valentino. But here, her amour is centered on her pup. After 20 years in Paris, Isadora Duncan's brother Raymond revisits New York. It's 14th of November, 1929. And clumsily following in his sister's graceful footsteps, Duncan models attire he believes all the world should wear. In spite of the comfort, Duncan's clothing was all Greek to everyone. It's 1923, and high wind worse firemen battling blaze at New York City's docking area. Pier 69 is doomed as municipal and port authority firefighters concentrate on confining the conflagration to the pier alone. Entire contents of Pier 69 are lost. Several firemen are injured and one man is killed. Hours after first alarm, pier is in smoldering ruins as New York Harbor takes a licking from the tongues of wind-fanned flames. It's 1920, and here at Calistoga, California, health seekers partake of the revitalizing effects of one of nature's remedies for what ails you. But no matter what you call it, it's still nothing but wet and sticky California mud. For once, we can see the advantage of being covered up with the 1920 idea of what a bathing suit should be. And children are scolded for making mud pies. This is what's known as making a mess of yourself. Or maybe it's just plain, unadulterated, dirty work. Now we know the meaning of a toast. Here's mud in your eye. It's 1930, and on her maiden voyage, the Europa, new pride of the North German Lloyd Line, cuts through Atlantic waters. Far behind her now lies the Cherbourg breakwater of France. Ahead lies the Ambrose Channel lightship, and a new record for an Atlantic crossing by steamship. On 20th of March, she sailed from Europe, and now it's the 25th of March. At average of nearly 28 knots an hour, she's traveled over 3,100 miles in four days, 17 hours, and six minutes. Here's proud skipper of record-smashing Europa, ship captain Nicholas Johnson. Under him, Europa makes mark on her maiden voyage. Record stands till 1936, when the Queen Mary twice made trip in faster time, second try in less than four days. It's 1932, as homes at Dudley, Staffordshire, England are destroyed. Officials put torch to homes that once housed workers and munitions plants in hectic years of First World War. No longer of any use, they are removed the easy way. 
In past years, they've served as homes for poor and unemployed, but better and more modern facilities are now available. So these poor man's palaces become a pyre. They don't hold a candle to newer homes. That's why they're being put to the torch. Economics at the University of Maryland. It's March 1926, as these southern bells of the jazz and flapper era make way for married life instead of whoopee. Here they're up to their high necklines in dress material and patterns. If that girl on the left has it, it must be a father's shirt and tie. Maybe they were short on hair in those days, but they were long enough on makeup. It's 11th of November, 1926, and here at Charlotte, North Carolina, are early moments of 25-mile race, one of features of Armistice Day celebration in big town of the Tar Heel State. Dash in world record time is famed racing car driver Lockhart. Before tumult for Lockhart dies, cars for second race depart on second speed test of afternoon. The winner and champion, speed driver Lewis. Going 50 miles in faster time than man has ever moved, here are contestants in half century grind. Winner and world record beater, low flyer Hartz. Furious and final event of afternoon is 100 Mile Dash. And top man this day in November 1926 is winner Leon Duray. 